Would you pray with me just one more time before we receive the preaching of the word of the Lord? Speak, Lord, for your servants hear. Speak, Lord, for your servants hear. Your servants are listening. Please speak to us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Your relationship to the word of the Lord is a matter of happiness or sadness. How you relate to God's word is a matter of happiness or sadness, holiness or sinfulness. Your treatment of the scriptures is a matter of depression or delight, strength or weakness. Your devotion to the Bible is a matter of salvation or damnation. How you treat the Word of God, God speaking to you through His Word, it's a matter of salvation or damnation. It truly is how we approach God's own word, how we treat it when God is speaking to us. It's a matter of life and death. And that's why, one of the reasons why, when we gather together for worship, the centerpiece of everything we're doing is hearing from God's own word in the scriptures. We need to know what God has to say to us. We need to know what the word of the Lord is. And then we need God to be gracious to us, help us understand it, and apply it to us. Listen to these few verses of Scripture so that you can understand what I mean and why I say your relationship to the word of God, your treatment of it, your devotion to it, is a matter of life and death. Hebrews 12.25. Hebrews 12.25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. God is speaking to you in the scriptures, and you better not refuse him who is speaking. Now consider James 1, 19 through 21. All three of these verses have to deal with listening to the teaching and preaching of God's word. I don't doubt at all that you've quoted verse 19 a ton, and you probably misapply it every time like I have for a majority of my life. The context is listening to God's word being preached. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. Receive in humility and meekness the implanted word of the Lord, which is able to save your souls. You and I are to receive the preaching and teaching of God's word because God uses that to save our souls. Now consider Isaiah 8, 19 and 20. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. It's Isaiah saying, when people in your day tell you, go here for truth. Go here for wisdom. Go here for enlightenment. Go here for revelation. Saying, when they say that, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? And then God says through Isaiah the prophet, to the teaching, to the testimony, means go to the scriptures, go to God's word. 
to the teaching, to the testimony, if they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Now consider Luke 16, 31. Christ in his parable of the rich man and Lazarus has Abraham, who's in heaven, speaking to this man who is in hell. And the man in hell is saying, send back someone from the dead so that he can warn my brothers, lest they end up in hell with me. So this is a parable Jesus is telling to teach us. This man, Abraham, send somebody back from the dead. If someone comes back from the dead, my brothers who are still alive and haven't yet come to hell, they will repent. They will believe on Christ. And this is what Christ has Moses, or rather Abraham, say to this rich man who's now in hell. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Application for you. If you do not listen to the scriptures, nothing, nothing, nothing will convince you. Nothing will be worked in you for salvation. That is the means by which God saves sinners and sanctifies his saints. His very word. Now the specific context of where we find ourselves now in 1 Samuel 3. What we learn here is how both Samuel and Eli respond to the word of the Lord. This chapter you probably see it in your own Bible in the heading. It says something like, the Lord calls Samuel. And that's right. This is the historical. This is what's happening. The Lord is calling this probably 12-year-old boy Samuel to be a prophet of the Lord. This is the Lord's specific call, and he's establishing Samuel as a prophet. So we can learn this is what the Lord's doing. He's raising up a prophet who will anoint the first king in Israel, King Saul, and who God uses then to anoint King David. And David is this foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord promises a kingdom and a throne to David and his descendants. And one of his descendants will sit on the throne forever. And that's Jesus. So God is using Samuel to do great things in God's plan of redemption. But if we want to apply chapter 3 to our lives today and see what should we learn from it, we need to pay careful attention to how both Samuel and Eli responded, what their relationship was like to God's word when it is spoken to them. That's what you and I should be gleaning from this chapter to make application for our own lives. Now let's walk through the text, and I'll make observations as we go. And once we understand that, then I'll apply it to us and help us understand, glean what we can learn from here. So I want you to pay attention, walk through this whole chapter with me so we can first just understand it. Verse 1 in chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. So he's being trained up to assist Eli, who is the high priest of God, in the temple of God. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There, were no frequent, there was no frequent vision. So in times past, God didn't only speak through the written word. At this time, all they've got is the first five books of the Bible that are actually pinned down. But in times past, God would appear to people and speak to them privately and to his prophets. And then his prophets would speak God's word to the people. But in this day, this revelation of God, God appearing to them as he had done to Moses, as he had done to Abraham, as he had done to Joshua, as he had done to others, it was rare. There was no frequent vision. Verse 2, at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. It's probably about midnight. The middle of the night, they're laying in bed. 
The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark, that's the ark of the covenant, where the ark of the covenant of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he, that is Eli, said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he, Samuel, went and lay down. The end of verse 1 is there to help us understand why Samuel hears the word of the Lord at first and just goes, oh, I guess that's Eli. Because the visions and God speaking in this way were so rare in this day that Samuel doesn't even have a context for the Lord speaking like that to people. And so he hears a voice and goes, well, it's got to be Eli. Because it was rare. There was no frequent vision. That's what the writer wants us to understand by verse 1. And then why Samuel keeps responding like this and not understanding that it's the Lord actually calling to him. Verse 6. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He keeps saying, I'm here. Because you just said my name. And Eli keeps saying, no, I didn't. Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord, Yahweh, was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Or speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Verse 10. And the Lord came and what? What's the word? And the Lord came and stood. The Lord came and stood. Calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. I think it is evident that this is the Lord Jesus Christ coming before his incarnation, before he became a human being. This is the Lord manifesting himself, and he's called the word of the Lord. Well, who do we know in the members, the persons of the Godhead that's called the word of the Lord? It's Jesus. This is the word of the Lord coming to stand next to Samuel and speaking directly to him, manifesting his presence to this probably 12-year-old boy, Samuel. Christ comes down, the word of the Lord, and speaks to Samuel. And notice what he says to him in verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. That means they're going to tremble when they hear this. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Now, what had the Lord spoken concerning Eli's house? You remember, have you read chapter 2? Because of what Eli allowed his sons to do and because of what his sons did, the Lord says, you won't have an old man in your house anymore. I'm going to cut off the strength of the arm of your house. Your family will no longer be in the high priestly line. I'm going to kill your sons. And this is the Lord sending Samuel to tell that to Eli. A 12-year-old boy speaking to 80, 90-year-old man. This is the first thing the Lord declares when he reveals himself to Samuel. 
verse 13. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. This is the Lord saying to Samuel, there's no way out for Eli's family. It's done. You cannot appeal to the sacrificial system. You can't say, okay, now, now, now I want to repent and be cleansed. He said, no, it, it's done. That time of opportunity is over. It will not happen. Their sin, their iniquity will not be atoned for. I am going to punish their family for blaspheming me. Verse 15. Think about how Samuel must be feeling. Twelve years old and that is the very first thing that the Lord says to him. The Lord is going to the Lord is speaking to me directly. Hey, I'm going to punish this old man that you serve. I'm going to punish him in his house. So Samuel lay until morning. Probably not even sleeping. Seems that the writer wants us to think he goes back to his bed and just laid there. He lay until morning. Then He opened the doors of the house of the Lord. This is his duty. This is what he's been doing. This is how he's been assisting in the temple. And so he goes about his normal duties. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. And I think we can all understand why he would be afraid to do that. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. Eli understands. He knows that what the Lord said to Samuel has to do with him. The man of God just previously in chapter 2 had come to Eli, this nameless man, and spoken on behalf of the Lord and said the same type things. I'm going to cut off the strength of your arm. You want to have an old man in your house. Your lineage are going to be beggars because... Of you scorning my sacrifices. And so Eli then knows the Lord is speaking to Samuel. And it seems like he assumes it's it's me. It's about me. Tell me, son. Tell me what the Lord said to you. Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. Eli knows that the Lord said he's going to punish me, didn't he? You better tell me everything he said, or whatever he said was going to happen to me, may it happen to you. He wants to know what God says. And so verse 18, so Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he, that is Eli, said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Now just pause there for a second. Did you read what the Lord said to Samuel? And then what Samuel relayed to Eli? The sins, the iniquities of your house that are leading me to move your family from the high priestly office. I'm going to kill your sons. Your descendants are going to be beggars. That's going to happen. And no sin will be able, or no atonement will be able to be made for that. He says that to Eli, and Eli responds, It's Yahweh. It's the Lord. It's the one true God. Let him do what seems good to him. Wow. Verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan, northernmost part, to Beersheba, southernmost part, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. 
And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. This is the word of God. This is the Lord appointing Samuel as this prophet of the Lord. Revealing his word to him. Confirming that he is going to throw down Eli's household and raise up Samuel as this prophet that he will use to lead the people, even judge the people, and anoint the first kings in Israel. But what I want you to make sure you don't miss is all of the things that we can glean from how these guys deal with the word of the Lord coming to them. But I have two questions to ask and answer before we do that. Question one. Since God spoke to Samuel and others through supernatural visions, should I expect him to do so to me? Boys and girls, did you see what's happening in this passage of Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ, 1,100 years before he actually came to the earth as a man, appears to Samuel, and Samuel sees him, and he speaks to this 12-year-old boy in a vision. And that's how Samuel knows this specific word of the Lord. Is that something that you should expect? And I should expect. If I want to hear from God, I need God to appear before me and speak audibly to me. Well, it happened here, didn't it? It happened in 1 Samuel 3. Why should I not expect that to happen? Because God says he doesn't do that anymore. That's not how he manifests his word to us. The answer is no. You should not expect God to appear to you in visions and give his word to you audibly like that. No. In times past, the Lord spoke in visions and dreams. Now he has spoken finally in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through his son's apostles in the scriptures. The answer is very simple. No. You should not expect visions from the Lord, or just little impressions of, I think the Lord just told me this. If you depend on that, you're on sinking sand. You can't look at passages like this and say, well, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so I should expect that too. Not when he says what he says in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus comes into the world, and we don't continue to have then visions and prophets. We have his apostles that he appointed to write down his word. And after the death of the apostles, you should expect no new revelation from God. So you don't depend on your feelings, you don't depend on your visions, you don't depend on your quiet time and what you think God is telling you. None of that is worth anything when it comes to new revelation from God or the words of God being communicated to you. He's spoken finally in his son. In John 16, Christ promises his apostles will write more scripture. When he says, I still have many things to say to you speaking to his apostles, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. Boys and girls, though you may want God to appear to you and speak to you audibly, or to be praying and just hear the word of God to you, you should not expect that to happen. God speaks to us through his scriptures. In times past, he used to do that until he had delivered to us the completed canon of scripture. He promised his apostles would reveal more things than those who are who wrote the New Testament. So, boys and girls, if you want to know what God says, read the Bible. And hear the Bible preached. All of you. 
If you go to someone and say, God told me, or I think God is telling me, if they love you, they should go, eh. say, no. God has spoken finally in his son. Give me chapter and verse or the necessary consequence or wisdom gleaned from what God says in his word. Don't you come to me and say, well, God, you know, and this is how Christians do it today. God really laid it on my heart to do this. It's like, why don't you just say, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. I have a conviction or an opinion or I think this or whatever. Just say that. If they love you, they should say, no, no, no. In times past, God did speak through visions and things like that. But he has spoken finally in his son and through his son's apostles. And what we have in the pages of scripture is the word of the Lord. Question two. How can I know what God wants me to know then? If I'm not to be looking for vision and signs, you know the answer already. You look to the scriptures, you study the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit works through the scriptures to give us light to understand and apply the scriptures to our own lives and to comprehend what God is saying in the scriptures. It's not that God the Holy Spirit is not active or inactive in some way. He's just not active currently in giving new revelation. He is giving what we call illumination, which means he brings to our remembrance things that we've read before. He helps us as we study the scriptures. God the Holy Spirit helps us understand what they mean and how to apply them in our lives. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You want to hear what comes from God's mouth? All scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You need the Bible. You want to hear God speak? Read the Bible. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 16 helps us understand that if we're in Christ, God the Holy Spirit helps us understand what the scriptures are saying and so that we receive it and believe it and comprehend it and then apply it and live by it. 2 Peter 1, 18 through 21, the Apostle Peter says, I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus was here on the earth in the flesh and he went up a mountain with Peter, James, and John, and his appearance is transfigured before them. And they see Jesus on top of this mountain in his unveiled glory. Peter says, I was there. And I heard God the Father's audible voice speak from heaven. Peter says, I was there. I heard the audible voice of God. And you know what's better than that? The Bible. That's what the Apostle Peter says. Says, I've, I've had those visions. I saw Jesus transfigured. I heard the audible voice of the Father as it split the sky and spoke for us to hear. You know what's better? The Apostle Peter says, the Bible. The Bible's better. Because we've got all of it. We've got it whenever we want. And we have God the Holy Spirit who helps us understand it. Boys and girls, children, can you imagine being with the Lord Jesus when he was here on the earth, when he came to live and die and arise to save us? Can you imagine being with him and him saying, hey, let's, let's hike up that mountain. And you walked up on top of this mountain with the Lord Jesus, and then all of a sudden, he was so bright that you could barely look at him. He was so glorious that you almost had to hide your eyes from him because you were seeing Jesus Christ in all of his excellencies and beauties and glories. Can you imagine seeing that? And then imagine if it gets even better and somehow the sky seems to split and you hear the voice of God the Father speaking from heaven saying, this is my son. Listen to him. 
you imagine if you heard the audible voice of God? You saw Jesus in his glory? Well, the apostle Peter did see that, and he did hear that. He had that experience. And when he writes a letter to churches, children, he says, I was there. I heard that. And the Bible is way better than that. That was one time on one mountain. The scriptures, we have 66 books of God speaking to us. The scriptures are way better than that because in the scriptures, God is speaking to us. So we shouldn't expect visions and signs like Samuel gives here. God reveals his word to us through the written word of God by the help and illumination of God the Holy Spirit. We had to clear those two questions out of the way first before we can apply what we learn in 1 Samuel 3. But now I want you understanding that in times past God spoke through visions and now, now he speaks through the written word of God to still understand that this is, these are both the word of the Lord. This is the Lord speaking to Samuel and Eli. And just as God speaks to us through the scriptures now. Now I want you to see and learn what we can glean from their relationship to the word of the Lord. First, look at verse 1. This is just a by the way, an inference from that. You and I should give thanks to God that his word is not rare or infrequent in our day. You and I should give thanks to God that his word is not rare. Look at it. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. All they had were the first five books of the Bible, and they didn't have a printing press. They didn't have what we have now, that everyone has their own copy. And so they depended on when the Lord would appear to one of the prophets and speak to them. And so Samuel and Eli are just going about their business with the first five books only, and mostly only what they had memorized. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. But believers, the word of the Lord is not rare in our day. You've got all of it. You've probably got multiple copies of the word of God. Something better than visions. You've got the mind of God revealed in the word of God. And the spirit of God helps you understand what he's saying. You should thank God for a Bible. Men have bled and died to give you this Bible in your own language. How dare you neglect it? The word of God was rare in Samuel's day, but it's not in ours. We can hear preaching. We can hear teaching. We even have the internet that you can listen to faithful Bible teaching all day, every day, whenever you want. If you didn't bring a hard copy of your Bible with you, you can pull it up on your phone in a matter of seconds. The word is not rare. We don't have to wait for the Lord to give us a vision to reveal what he wants us to know. We can go to the Bible any and every day and hear the Lord God speak to us. What a blessing the Bible is. William Gurnall in The Christian in Complete Armor says, not only should we bless God for the Bible, we should bless God for the English translation of the Bible. We should praise God that we, can you imagine if you had to learn Greek in order to read the New Testament? Or you had to learn Hebrew in order to read the Old Testament? It's not so. Gurnall says, bless God for the translation of the scriptures. The word is our sword. And being translated, Gurnall says, being translated into English, the sword is pulled out of the sheath. And we get to swing it around to the glory of God. Praise God that the word of God is not rare in your day. Men in times past labored tirelessly and eventually died to translate the Bible into English. 
Men like William Tyndale. Boys and girls, look up at me. In 1536, almost 500 years ago, there was a man named William Tyndale in England. And in the day he lived, it was illegal to get the Bible into the English language. The language I'm speaking right now, the one you know how to speak and listen to, it was against the law of the king to translate the Bible into our language. And so what did William Tyndale do? He said, well, the king said I can't do it. He said, I don't care what the king said. I have a higher king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these people in England, they need the Bible in their own language. So he then spent years translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into our English language. And it was illegal for people to have them. So he would smuggle them in secretly and bring them in carts that had a bunch of clothes and linens in it. He would hide Bibles in there and sneak them into England so that he could give them to people like you and me. And the king finally caught up with him in 1536. And you know what happened to William Tyndale? Forgetting the Bible to you and me in our own language, they set him on fire and watched him burn to death. That's the price that has been paid by men before us so that you and I could read the Bible in private worship, in family worship, in public worship like this so that we don't all have to learn different languages, but we can just clearly understand this is what God is saying to us. Adults, don't neglect the gift that is the Word of God. Look how rare it was in this day. It was rare. Not so with us. We should praise God for that. I want you to think, what, what do I give thanks for? In your prayers, I hope that you have parts of your prayers, your private prayers and public prayers, that you just thank the Lord for anything you can think of. What do you thank God for? You should include the Bible in that thanksgiving. Even include the fact that the Bible's been translated so we can know God through his word. That's the first thing. We should give thanks that his word is not rare or infrequent in our day. Now second, you and I, we need to learn, we come to know the Lord in a saving way and a sanctifying way through the word of the Lord. We come to know God personally, be saved by him in Christ. And once we're saved, we grow to be more like him and know him more, have more intimacy and fellowship with him. Through the word, through the scriptures, through God speaking to us. Look at verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. But when the word of the Lord comes to Samuel, God reveals himself to him. And so it is with you and I. God reveals himself to us in a saving way. So that we can be saved from our sins and cling to Christ. He also reveals himself to us more and more in an intimate way. So that we grow to love him and cherish him more. All through the scriptures. It's the word of the Lord that enables us to know the Lord. The creation of God, what God has created. Everything that we can see shows forth his existence and his great power. We know that God exists because we can see that everything didn't come from nothing. God created everything. And we can see his great power in the fact that he created all of this and upholds all of this. So we know he exists. We know his, he's powerful. And then by his providence, God shows his goodness and his sovereignty. That he takes care of us. He feeds and causes his sun to shine even on the wicked. So God shows forth his goodness and his sovereignty by his works of providence. 
but only the word of God shines forth God's face. You can only come to know the Lord in a saving way and you believers in a sanctifying way through the word of the Lord. This is how you come to know him. You need to have that nailed down. It's primarily through the scriptures that we come to know the Lord more intimately. Through hearing, through reading, through memorizing, through meditating upon the scriptures. In that God comes to us and speaks to us. And to know the Lord in this way is far more than just to know about him. We do learn about the Lord in the scriptures, but we come to know him. To know him intimately. To know him personally. As you get to know someone more intimately and personally, the more you sit alone with them and just talk. You talk to one another. Talk to one another. Talk to one another. That's how you get to know someone more intimately. And you really don't just know about them, but I know them. This is how you get to know the Lord more intimately and personally. Let him talk to you. Get alone. Let him talk to you. Listen when the Bible is preached and let him talk to you. He's speaking to you even now as the word is being preached. Every passage of scripture that's being quoted and explained, God the Holy Spirit is working to help you understand it. And God is speaking as we speak the word. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life. This is eternal life. That they know you. Jesus in his incarnation, he's praying to the Father the night before he's crucified for us and says, what is eternal life? This is eternal life. That they know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What does eternal life look like? Knowing God. Knowing God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Eternal life doesn't, ha- doesn't just have to do with duration. It has to do with quality. This is what eternal life looks like, knowing God intimately. So do you want to know him more? Do you want to know him at all? Go to the scriptures. This is how we come to know the Lord, and he reveals himself to us through the word of God, through hearing it, through reading it, through receiving preaching of it, through meditating on it, through memorizing it. This is what you must go to if you want to know the Lord. Now, thirdly, when you and I come to hear or read the scriptures, we should say, like Samuel, or like, rather like Eli tells Samuel to say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. That is a great way to approach the scriptures. If you're coming to the scriptures in private or family or before you come on the Lord's day to hear the word preached and you're thinking like, how do I prepare myself? What do I pray in preparation? What a great short prayer. Just go to the Father in the name of Christ and say, speak, Lord, for your servant, the one who belongs to you. I belong to you. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Your servant is listening. Do you think God will answer that prayer? He will. Go to him and just say, whatever you say in your word, speak to me. Help me to understand it. Help me to apply it. I'm listening. It reminds us, if we would pray that before we come to the scriptures, it reminds us that everything we read here is God speaking to us. And it reminds us also that we need to diligently pay attention to everything that God says. So tell him, speak to me. Why? Because I am your servant and I'm listening. If you'll speak, I will listen. Make that your prayer. I encourage you, before you read the word in private worship or in family worship, even if it's just for a season, memorize that. And you fathers, lead your families in that. Help your wife and your children 
if you have them, to memorize that too. Just speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Just look at young boy Samuel submitting to the word and saying, I'm here. I need you. I want you to speak. And I'm listening. Make that your prayer. Fourth. What we learn in the beginning of verse 18 is whatever God says in his word, you and I should tell it plainly to others. Even if it is hard for us to tell or hard for others to hear. Just pull back and remember, Samuel is being established as a prophet and the very first thing the Lord says to him is, I'm going to destroy your leader's house. Just remember the lump that had to have been in his throat as he laid in his bed all night. And then Eli finally says, you better tell me what God says. And finally, then we read at the beginning of verse 18. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. We can learn by Samuel's example how we need to treat the word of God. Whatever you read in the word, whatever God says, don't you dare hide it from people. Don't you dare keep it to yourself by not evangelizing. Don't you dare keep it to yourself by not telling people some of the harder things in Scripture that you kind of want to hide for a little bit because you think that that might turn them off. No, just tell them this is what God says. God says this, and we need not be ashamed of it. When the Word of God makes us uncomfortable, and if you're anything like me and what I've been like in times past, I remember I used to read constantly, read things that I'd go, oh, I don't want an unbeliever to see that. Or, wow, I don't understand that at all. I don't know why God would do that. I used to think those kind of things. And it's because I was uncomfortable with what God said in his word and how he worked and what he revealed and what he did. I didn't understand it. I was uncomfortable by it. And when that happens to you or to me, it just shows how much further we have to go in order to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. If the Word of God makes you uncomfortable, it's because you have much further to go in being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. When you don't like something in the Bible, it doesn't reveal anything wrong with the Lord. It plainly reveals things wrong with you. And you need to get that down. If you're uncomfortable, let that remind you. I need to be conformed more to the likeness of Jesus. But what many people do is find uncomfortable things in the scriptures, and then they find someone who agrees with them and who can confirm that, hey, they also don't like that, and they've got an alternate view or a way to kind of step around some of these things, and you just might try to avoid it. We can't do that. Face it. If it makes you uncomfortable, it means I have a lot of growing to do. It is embarrassing to me how so many professed Christians seem embarrassed by God's word. It's embarrassing how many professed Christians seem embarrassed by things in the scripture. You and I are not allowed to be embarrassed by anything in the word of God. Every one of you, look in my eyes. You are not allowed to be embarrassed by anything in God's word. If it makes you uncomfortable, you are the problem, not God. I am the problem, not God. We should be embarrassed about none of it. Hold none of it back. Sinners need it for their salvation. God reveals harsh things and threatenings against sinners if they won't repent as one of the ways that it wakes them up and that they flee from the judgment to come and go to Jesus Christ. 
do not hide that from them because you think it'll make them uncomfortable or it makes you uncomfortable. Don't hold any of it back. Look at little 12-year-old Samuel as your, as your example. But he says something very hard to say to Eli and very hard for Eli to hear. And still, he held none of it back. Whatever the Lord says, you can say. And if people want to get upset, they can get upset with God. You and I are only messengers. Wilhelm well, A. Brockle, the great Dutch further reformer in the 17th century, said, To withhold scripture from anyone is an act of robbery, as well as spiritual murder. To withhold the scripture from anyone is an act of robbery, as well as spiritual murder. So I ask you to just think for yourself, are you embarrassed by any part of God's word? Does the way that God says men and women are to function in this world, does that make you uncomfortable? Does the way that God destroys entire civilizations, the men, the women, and the children at times in the Old Testament... Does that make you uncomfortable? Think about whatever it is for you that you're embarrassed or it makes you really uncomfortable, these parts of the scripture, and just think right off of that, springboard from that into, I need God to change me more. Because he is perfect and all of his ways are just and he only does what is good. And I have a problem with him doing that. Or saying that. Let that springboard you in to begging God to sanctify you. To make you more like Christ. To use those things that perhaps bother you. To help you grow. Now fifth. The next part of verse 18. What we learned here and what we should glean from Eli and Samuel. Eli in particular in this part. Whatever God says in his word you and I should humbly submit to it. Not only not be embarrassed by it, but whatever God says, we submit to it. God has spoken, that settles it. Remember what Samuel said to Eli. And again, look at his response. My family's going to be cut off. Sons are going to be executed. My posterity's going to be poor beggars and he said second part of verse 18 it is the Lord let him do what seems good to him it's a way of saying it's the Lord his ways are perfect no matter how painful they are for me no matter how costly they are for me no matter how much I may not like it whatever God says in his word you and I should humbly submit to it like Eli. Lest we find ourselves rebuked like Job is rebuked at the end of Job. He says, stand up, Job. Dress for action like a man. And I'm going to ask you questions now. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Or like the Apostle Paul does in Romans 9. When he's explaining God's sovereign choice and election. He answers these questions that he knows all of us have as we're thinking about God has chosen some for salvation and not chosen others. So he starts asking the obvious questions that we all ask. Is God unjust? How, can we, how are we held accountable then? Because who can re resist his will? And Paul just finally gets to a point where he stops answering the questions and points the finger back at you and says, Who are you, O oh man, to question God? And some of you need to go read Romans 9 again if you're uncomfortable with God's sovereign choice and election. And you need to be humbled and say like Eli, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Who are you, O oh man? So, beloved... However hard of a pill to swallow a truth of the scripture is, learn to say with Eli, it's the Lord. 
However bitter a providence or severe an affliction the Lord works in your life, learn to say with Eli, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. What can you think of right now, either in the word or in the Lord's dealing with you by his providence, that you desperately need God to work in you the humility and submission that Eli had? What do you have a problem with that's happened in your life? Lord, why'd you allow this to happen? What do you see in the word that you say, I don't really like that? You desperately need God to work in you the humility that Eli had so that you can say the same thing as him. Now, sixthly and finally, what you should learn from verse 19 is whatever God says in his word, it will prove true. Whatever God says, it will prove true. Look at verse 19 in 1 Samuel 3. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Why did none of Samuel's words fall to the ground? It's because he's a prophet of the Lord, and he's speaking the words of the Lord. What you and I should learn from this is exactly what Proverbs 30 verse 5 says. Every word of God proves true. If God says it, you can take it to the bank. If God threatens, whatever is going to happen in that threatening will happen if you don't repent. Whatever God promises will be given to you. Whatever God says are the effects of his word. Like when he says, my word will not return to me void. If it goes forth, it will accomplish everything that I want it to accomplish. Which is our great encouragement to speak the word, to preach the word, to share the word, to do everything we can to get the word out. Because God says, it will not return to me void. I will accomplish my purpose with it. If he says that, it's going to happen. Every word of God proves true. None of his words will fall to the ground. That means none of them will spill out to the ground and be wasted. That's what verse 19 means. None of his words fall to the ground. It's it's like liquid that falls out and then just kind of wastes on the ground. The Lord is saying here, Because I put my words in Samuel's mouth and he's speaking my words, all of them will prove true. And it's the same for you and for me when we read the scriptures. Every word of God proves true. Isn't that a joy and a delight? Every threatening will come true for you if you do not repent. You should use that truth. Everything God says will happen. Use it for warning and for awakening. What are you making peace with that the Lord has promised death if you don't turn from it? Every one of his warnings, every one of his threatenings will prove true. If by the flesh you sow corruption and sin, then you're going to reap corruption. If you walk by the flesh and indulge in sin, what's going to grow from that is death. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You can't get around that. And so what what are you making peace with? What are you sowing in your own life that just brings about death in your life? Because the Lord has promised. He won't be mocked. None of the words of God's threatenings will fall to the ground. You who are not yet in Christ, you need to know that he says he's fixed the day that he is going to judge the world in righteousness. You will be held accountable for your sin. You cannot get around that. That threatening will not fall to the ground. It will come true. So turn to Jesus Christ and go to him before it is too late. But use this truth also for exhortation. He's promised his word will not return void, and that promise will not fall to the ground. 
So speak it, preach it, share it, publish it, however you can. And God's word will not return to him void. But use this, use this truth to comfort yourself. Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. As God does with all of the scriptures, none of his words will fall to the ground. None of his promises will fall to the ground. His sword will protect your soul. God's knife will cut out your spiritual cancers so that you grow in conformity to Jesus. His loving kindness will follow you all the days of your life. His house will be your house. His medicine will heal your soul. His arms will hug your neck. His face will be seen by you without the veil. None of God's promises will fall to the ground, beloved. You who believe and cling to Christ, let me ask you these questions to close. Has God promised to forgive you your sins for Christ's sake? That promise will not fall to the ground. Entrust yourself to Jesus Christ. Has God promised to bring to completion the good work that he began in you? That promise will not fall to the ground. Has God promised that Christ will eventually put all his enemies under his feet? And go forth in confident assurance that Christ will win. And we get to win alongside him. Has God promised he will crush Satan underneath your feet? In Romans 16, 20, he has. Then fight your sin and stand firm against the schemes of the devil and cling to the promise. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Has God promised to make all things work together for your good, believer? Has he promised to take every sweet and bitter providence and work it all together for his glory and your ultimate good? Then rest. Rest in that promise. Do not fear even what you are suffering. And say with Eli, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Do you want to be forgiven of your sin and reconciled to God? Go to the scriptures. They testify about the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to be happy? Eat the scriptures. As Jeremiah the prophet says, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me the joy and delight of my heart. Do you want to be happy? Eat the Bible. Feast on the scriptures. Do you want to be holy as God is holy, believers? Then go to the scriptures. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, Christ prays in John 17. Do you want to be wise? Go to the Bible. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 19.7. Do you want to be revived and not so glum or down? Go to the Bible. Psalm 19.7 again. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Do you want to hate sin? Go to the word of God. Psalm 119, 104, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You want to hate your sin more? Go to the Bible. You want to be enlightened? Go to the scriptures. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 19, 8. You want to live a life of obedience? Go to the word of God. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You want to be fortified against suffering? So that when suffering comes upon you, you don't despair, you don't lose heart? Go to the perfect and sufficient word of God. Psalm 119, 50, this is my comfort in my affliction. 
that your promise gives me life. You want to be comforted in your affliction? Bank on the promises revealed in the scripture. You want to know the Lord God, Father, Son, and Spirit more and enjoy Him more, delight in Him more, rejoice in Him more? Go to the word of the Lord. You'll never be disappointed when you devote yourself to God's word. Pray with me. Our Father, we ask you to help us have a deep hunger for your word as you reveal to us in the scriptures. Help us to not hide anything. Help us not to be embarrassed by anything in your word. Help us to submit to everything that you say in your word. Help us to be thankful that you've given us your word, even in our own language. And may we not neglect it. Do not let us neglect it, Lord. We give you thanks that the word of God is not rare in our day, but that you reveal yourself constantly to us through your scriptures. Give us life according to your promise. Save, sanctify, purify your church, glorify your great name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.